All right, we're going to get started. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to UT Southwestern Science Cafe. My name is Jenny King, and I lead the UT Southwestern Public Affairs team and our Science Cafe program, along with Charlandra Thompson. Thank you for joining us tonight, whether this is your first Science Cafe or if you're a regular guest. Science Cafes are online conversations where speakers take you on deep dives into the science of healthcare. As an academic medical center, UT Southwestern brings together research, health education, and patient care into one institution. This evening, we're discussing cancer and clinical trials, from scientific discoveries to new treatments with Dr. David Gerber and Dr. Heather MacArthur. More on them in just a moment. For now, I have a few technical points to share. We are recording this program and also live streaming it on our UT Southwestern Twitter page. We ask you to please mute your microphones to help with audio clarity for all. Also, we encourage guests to leave your video camera on so we can see each other, especially during the Q&A portion of our program. And finally, just a reminder, while we can't answer personal questions, medical questions, we do welcome your general questions about cancer and clinical trials. Please list your questions in the chat. As moderator, Charlie will address your questions after the conclusion of our presentations. And now I am so pleased to introduce our faculty speakers. Dr. Heather Lynn MacArthur is an associate professor in the Department of Internal Medicine and clinical director of the cancer program here at UT Southwestern Simmons Comprehensive Cancer Center. She also serves as a Komen Distinguished Chair in Clinical Breast Cancer Research. Her research focuses on innovations in the diagnosis and treatment of breast cancer, and she has special interests in developing immunotherapy strategies for patients. Dr. MacArthur earned her medical degree at the University of Toronto and completed a residency in internal medicine at the University of Calgary. She received advanced training through a medical oncology fellowship at the University, University of British Columbia and an advanced clinical research fellowship in breast cancer at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. She graduated with a bachelor's of science with honors in physiology from the University of British Columbia and a master's degree in public health from Harvard University. Dr. MacArthur joined UT Southwestern in 2021 and previously, she served as Medical Director of Breast Oncology at Cedars-Sinai Medical Center in LA. UT Southwestern Medical Oncologist, Dr. David Gerber, specializes in treating patients with lung cancer, a disease from which more people die every year than colon, breast, and prostate cancer combined. Dr. Gerber is a professor in the Department of Internal Medicine and member of its Division of Hematology Oncology. He serves as associate clinical director of excuse me associate director of clinical research at Simmons Comprehensive Cancer Center. Originally from Chicago, Dr. Gerber graduated cum laude with a bachelor's degree in history from Yale University, and he received his medical degree at Cornell University Medical College. He completed his internship and residency in internal medicine here at UT Southwestern, where he served as chief resident. He then received dating through a fellowship in medical oncology at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Board certified in internal medicine and medical oncology, Dr. Gerber joined our faculty in 2007. We will hear from Dr. MacArthur and Dr. Gerber and then Dr. MacArthur again. We're going back and forth tonight. So I just want to say thank you to both of them. Um, welcome to Science Cafe and Dr. MacArthur, the virtual podium is yours. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. I'm going to share my screen now. Um, confirm that you can see those slides. Um, thank you for that really kind introduction. And thank you so much to all of you for joining us today. And thank you for turning your videos on. It's so great to see um, so many friendly faces. So today we're going to talk about cancer and clinical trials from scientific discovery to new treatments and just to give you a quick overview of the program that we have outlined for you today. First, Dr. Gerber is going to talk about clinical trials in general for cancer. He's going to give you a, a lovely overview. Then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about clinical trials in action, specifically innovations in breast cancer. And then Dr. Gerber is going to close us out in talking about improving clinical trial design and contact, or sorry, conduct rather. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. 
Gerber, um, if you don't mind starting us off with the first polling question. Great, thank you, Dr. MacArthur. So uh, I asked the group, um, what percentage of U.S. adults with cancer participate in cancer clinical trials? And your best guess, is it less than 5%? Is it 10% or is it closer to 50%? And I have to interrupt. For some reason, Zoom is not letting me launch the polls. I'm so sorry. So I'm glad that we have these slides that you can read to them and everyone can think about what their answer might be and put it in the chat. And Jenny, just let me know when you want me to go on to the next one then. Well, tell us uh, what the answer is maybe. Oh, well, I was gonna save that for later in the presentation. If that's okay, all. Well, we'll have to pay attention then. <laughs> yeah, that's at right, the end. <laughs> it's a post-test. Okay. Okay, let's go on to the next question then. And that is at what stage of development can new cancer treatments be approved? Phase one trials? phase two trials or phase three trials? Hmm. There are tests at the end on this question too, Dr. Gerber? You know what, I think so. I just really <laughs> enjoy creating anxiety and suspense. So, um, and what's great is that I'm actually seeing uh, quite a bit of a variety among the answers that are coming in. So why don't we go ahead uh, to the next slide and we'll go through some things. So I think it's helpful briefly to go over the phases of clinical trials that exist. And these phases and these terms are not unique to cancer clinical trials. They're used for clinical trials in general. So after we've done extensive preclinical research, in petri dishes, in animals, and we figured out that something looks promising and reasonably safe, a decision is made to bring it into people. And we usually start with a phase one trial, relatively small, unusual for it to be more than 50 patients, but sometimes some of our newer clinical trials can actually wind up being a few hundred, that's an exception. And there, at least traditionally, we were really focused on well, even though it looked good and safe in the lab, let's just make sure it's safe in people and make sure that we understand how to dose it in people. And if that went according to plan and we had a good dose in mind, then we did phase two clinical trials. And that's where we're focused on the effectiveness of a treatment and also still looking at its side effects. And typically that's a few dozen patients. Sometimes it's more than a hundred, often less than a hundred patients. And if that looks promising, then oftentimes the confirmatory clinical trials, what we call a phase three clinical trial. And that's where we're comparing our new treatment that we've been studying in phase one and phase two trials to the best existing treatment. So oftentimes, there are two groups or two arms in the trials and patients may be randomized, meaning the patient doesn't choose which treatment they get. We don't choose which treatment the patient gets. Sometimes the treatments may be blinded. So not only do we not know, do we not choose which treatment someone gets, but we may not even know after starting the treatment. And that may be hundreds of people and in a study like that, if it does look like the new treatment is truly better than the existing treatment, that's generally the point of FDA approval. Phase four trials, which we tend not to focus on very much here, are done after something has been approved just to make sure it's still looking like it's working well in a real world population after it's used widely. Next slide, please. So, but sometimes you don't need hundreds of patients to see a clear benefit. And as shown in this slide, some cancer treatments are approved after a phase two trial 
And actually some treatments have been approved after a phase one trial. So this is a trial of a new treatment used for a subset of lung cancer. And as you can see on the lower right, this subset of lung cancer that has something called a HER2 mutation is pretty rare. It's only 2% of lung cancer cases. But in this phase two trial, about 90 patients were enrolled and they all got the treatment. There was no randomization. And what I show you in the top left of the slide is something called a waterfall plot. And that's showing how much the tumor grows or eventually shrinks. And if the line for a patient is in the yellow going up, as you see on the far left of that picture, that means it grew despite the treatment. And if the line is going down, that means the cancer shrank. Well, you can see that the cancer is shrinking in almost every single patient. And the lower plot shows something similar, but it's also showing how long it works over time with each line showing the cancer shrinkage or growth and how long it stays shrunk in some cases with some of those patients followed for more than two years and it's still working. And based on this trial of about 90 patients, no phase three trial, the FDA approved this drug. And I think that's the right thing to do. It's clearly working and well tolerated. Next slide. I do think there are a lot of misconceptions that may lead people to fear or mistrust clinical trials. I think most of us in the field of cancer think of clinical trials not really as a secondhand alternative to standard treatment, but maybe as the ideal treatment of cancer. And that's, I think, for one reason is that we always feel that there's improvement when it comes to cancer treatment. We can either make our treatments better, safer, or, or even just more convenient. And I also don't think of clinical trials just as people who, just for people who've already had a lot of standard treatment and have exhausted those options. It's something to think about from the start. But the fact is, is that when you're handed a 30 page consent form about a trial to review, that can be really intimidating. And it's important to remember that in a typical 30 page consent form, only about two pages is telling you about side effects of the treatment. And so I wanna go through some of the few misconceptions that can be intimidating. So when someone decides to go on a clinical trial, that is not an irreversible decision. That is not um, signing a 30-year mortgage. So someone can start a trial and um, I may tell them we have to stop the treatment because it's not working or it's not safe, or they may decide to stop the treatment at any point, either because um, they're moving to California because they don't like the side effects or they just don't like me as their physician and they wanna go somewhere else. But what about when I talk about this randomization and this blinding, I mean, where does placebo come in in oncology trials? Is it possible to get placebo? It is, but in the field of oncology, you're really never gonna get placebo by itself. It's always going to be added to something that we already consider probably the best possible treatment available now, and we're just trying to make it better. And when you go on a clinical trial, are there additional costs that you have to pay that you wouldn't otherwise? The answer is no. So on a clinical trial, depending on how it's designed, there may, may be a lot of CAT scans and blood tests and, and even administration of chemotherapy that would be done anyway. But anything beyond that, um, extra medicines, extra visits, extra blood tests. We don't ask patients or their insurance to pay for. That's all paid for by the study sponsor. And we don't open a clinical trial until all those I's and all, all those I's are dotted and all those T's are crossed. Next slide. So the fact is, is that when you go on a clinical trial, you may not get a new treatment. Maybe that's because the study isn't looking at new treatments, it's looking at older treatments, or maybe only half the people on the trial get the new treatment. And I truly believe that it actually doesn't matter what you get assigned to in a clinical trial 
They offer the best or the highest level of care possible. Why is this? Is because when you go on a clinical trial, the rose petals get thrown down and the red carpet gets rolled out because besides the physicians and the nurses and the clinic staff, you have a group of other people who are your advocates now and on your team. And those are our clinical research personnel. And here I show you our managers and nurses and coordinators and data specialists for our lung team. And they've worked with me for years. And sometimes I feel like I'm the weakest link in the chain. And in the middle is Kasha. She's one of our coordinators. I just wanna read you what she told me when I asked her why she did this. She said, I love my patients and their families. We become very close over the course of a clinical trial. I treat them how I wish my brother, who had cancer years ago, and family were treated when we were seeking help. When I first meet with my patients, I tell them that I know this is a very difficult time, but I will do whatever I can do to make it at least a tiny bit easier for them. I schedule their appointments, I update their medications and side effects, and I provide them with a study drug. I listen to their concerns and fears. They tell me about their kids' piano concerts, visiting alpaca farms, granddaughter's dance recitals, trips to Prince Edward Island, art classes, and how to grow basil. They ask me about my kids and husband, travel plans, my childhood in Poland and Florida, and my love of Tom Brady. They are not just a number. They are wonderful people who are battling an awful disease, who put their trust in us, and who I have a privilege of knowing and helping navigate through a clinical trial. It's about making a meaningful human connection to someone who deserves empathy and understanding. Next slide. So we offer cancer clinical trials at all of our sites, including our affiliates, Children's Medical Center, Parkland Health, and all of our UT Southwestern cancer clinical sites, not only here in Dallas, but Fort Worth, Richardson Plano, and soon Redbird in South Dallas. As a National Cancer Institute designated comprehensive cancer center, at any given time, we have more than 200 active clinical trials. And that's probably several times what a typical smaller oncology practice might be able to offer. Each year, we enroll more than 1,000 patients to cancer clinical trials. And here at the Simmons Cancer Center, more than one third of them are underrepresented minorities, either African-American or Hispanic. And that's about the highest rate of underrepresented minorities in clinical trials at any cancer center in the United States. And we have a staff of about 110 individuals, just like Kasha, who help us do that. To demonstrate how our cancer clinical trials have made truly exciting advances, Dr. MacArthur is now gonna discuss her work in breast cancer. Thank you, Dr. Gerber. I'm going to start out, that was such a great opening. I'm gonna start out, I know our polling isn't working, but by asking all of you, if you've been directly affected by breast cancer, either your own diagnosis, a friend, a family member who um, has been affected, this is a yes, no question. And I ask that just to set the stage because it's such a common problem. There are more than 2 million new cases of breast cancer each and every year worldwide and approximately 300,000 new cases in the United States alone. So it's a really prevalent problem. And a lot of people ask me where the lifetime risk numbers come from. And you can see here that um, in your 20s, 30s, and 40s, the risk of developing breast cancer is relatively low. But in your 50s, 60s, and 70s, that number goes up. And if you add all of those numbers in the right-hand column, you get to 12.8% lifetime risk. And that's where that one in eight number comes from that we hear about. We hear that incidence of breast cancer, the number of people affected by breast cancer is about one in seven or one in eight women. So I just wanted to provide that um, background for how we get to that number. So it's a very, very prevalent problem, obviously. And I would expect that if our polling was working, that the number of people who stated that they were affected by breast cancer or knew someone affected by breast cancer would be very high. Um, the, um, what's happening in terms of rates of breast cancer, so the incidence of breast cancer is going up. So the number of new breast cancer cases has been going up over the last 30 plus years. Um, and that's in 
kind of a strange way, a good thing. It's because of improvements in technology. Mammograms have improved. The technology that we have to support mammographic screening has improved. And with education, with mobile um, mammography units, we've had more uptake in mammographic screening as well. So the incidence is going up, but it really reflects a lot of uh, innovation, quite frankly. Another piece of good news, I hope, is that trends in breast cancer survival are improving. So with each passing year, we are seeing better and better outcomes for women affected by breast cancer and even men affected by breast cancer. So you can see here that survival, in this case, five years specific, survival is improving over time. There are unfortunately some discrepancies um, and uh, Dr. Gerber mentioned um, disparities. And you can see here that survival outcomes are different for white patients than black patients. And we actually can make a really big contribution here at UT Southwestern in terms of understanding discrepancies um, and whether they're access issues or biologic issues. And with our diverse network, uh, we're really paying a lot of attention um, to those disparities. But the overarching message here is that the trends in breast cancer survival are improving over time. And why is that? Well, it's really related not only to earlier diagnoses. So as I said, the technology has improved. Education has led to earlier um, screening and more uptake with mammography. So that's contributed significantly in terms of identifying breast cancers early on. The earlier you detect them, the more likely you are to be able to cure people of their disease. So that is certainly an important piece, but innovation and drug development has played a huge role in improving outcomes um, for, uh, for people affected by breast cancer. And it's in recent years that we have seen an unprecedented number of FDA approvals for the treatment of breast cancer. And the only way that we understand whether new drugs or promising strategies are going to be effective for the treatment of breast and any other kind of cancer is through thoughtful, scientifically rigorous clinical trial design. And those brave men and women who participate in those clinical trials and are open to the option of trying something new that is intended to further advance the field. So it's really the only way that we move the needle is through clinical trial design and these numbers directly reflect that. So I'm gonna move on to the next polling question, which is um, the following. Drugs that boost the immune system may be effective in treating some breast cancers. Um, maybe many of you have heard about immune therapy for the treatment of cancer in general. Question is true or false, is it relevant for breast cancer? And without further ado, I'm gonna make an argument that it is. So Dr. Gerber showed you, these are called spider plots. And if the lines go above the dotted line, the cancer is growing. Um, and if it's going down below the dotted line, the cancer is shrinking. And this is a spider plot from um, a clinical trial where patients were treated with immune therapy and immune therapy for breast cancer specifically. And you can see that there are a lot of lines that are going below that dotted line indicating the shrinkage of their tumors. But what's even more notable, and these are patients with advanced stage four metastatic breast cancer, is that the lines are not only going below that dotted line, those lines are, are, are sort of horizontal, if you will, indicating that not only are tumors responding, but there's durability to those responses. And with chemotherapy in the past, for, at least for breast cancer, we can hold disease under control typically for a few months at a time, um, but eventually the tumor starts to misbehave and we have to change therapies every few months. So here for the first time, we were really seeing these long lasting results. And the idea is that basically, if you can train your own immune system to recognize the specific features of your cancer, and just like you're different than everyone else on planet earth, the biologic features of your cancer are gonna be different than everyone else's. 
So if you can overcome that diversity by training the immune cells to recognize the unique biologic features of your own cancer, that it could develop memory and in turn, long-term control of that same cancer. So this was really an unprecedented experience for us in treating stage four metastatic breast cancer, advanced breast cancer that is spread outside the breast to distant sites like lung and liver to be able to have the sustainable control of disease. And I'd like to share with you um, a patient experience. This is um, more than 10 years ago now, a patient who um, was in her thirties diagnosed with early stage breast cancer it came back very soon after her curative intent, chemotherapy and surgery and radiation. Um, we treated it again with curative intent and ultimately, unfortunately, within a sh very short period of time, it came back in the lung and in the lymph nodes. So in the red, you can see that's a central lymph node for those of you who aren't used to looking at PET scans is a PET scan and the red circle, that black area, is metastatic breast cancer to a lymph node in the central chest. And that circle, that black dot, which is circled in blue, is a metastasis of breast cancer that is spread into the lung. So she has now stage four advanced breast cancer that is spread to lung and lymph node outside of the breast. And so this is stage four disease. And I was very worried about her because I had given her all of my best chemotherapy treatment and she'd had good surgery and good radiation, but it came back as stage four disease very quickly. And I knew that if I gave her more chemotherapy that she would probably die um, within three to six months. So I was extremely concerned and I called my friend, I was in New York at the time, I called my friend at NYU and got her on a clinical trial of immune therapy and you can see that with the immune therapy strategy, so again, these are drugs that boost the immune system. And if you could target that um, immune response on tumor specific biology, you can develop potentially long-term immune memory that could potentially keep disease under control. Um, and so you can see those black dots are completely gone, which meant that she had complete resolution of her advanced disease. Um, she ultimately came off the uh, clinical trial because she did have some significant side effects that necessitated her coming off trial. But she's now more than six years after her metastatic triple negative breast cancer diagnosis. She goes for scans every few months. She remains without any evidence of metastatic disease, and she does not require any treatment to control her disease. So this is really, in my experience, an unprecedented um, patient experience where, um, because typically metastatic breast cancer requires a lifetime of, of control and has impact on life expectancy. And she's now years out without any evidence of cancer, not requiring any treatment. And it begs the question, are we now curing metastatic breast cancer with these um, novel strategies. And I would argue that we are. So we've seen now in large randomized phase three trials, this is a study where immune therapy was given with chemotherapy for stage four advanced, what we call triple negative breast cancer. So breast cancer that's lacking in the three key biomarkers that we look for. And here there was a huge improvement, really unprecedented improvement in life expectancy with the addition of immune therapy to chemotherapy. And that led very quickly to the FDA approval um, of immune therapy for advanced triple negative disease. And whenever we see really effective strategies in the metastatic or advanced setting, we often move those same strategies into the curative intent setting to see if we can improve cure rates and prevent metastatic disease from occurring. And that's exactly what we did with immune therapy um, we took a study where we gave curative intent chemotherapy with or without immune therapy. And as early as three years out from enrollment on the trial, we're seeing an almost 8% improvement in cure rate with the addition of immune therapy. And this is because hundreds and hundreds of women participated in a clinical trial where a computer randomized them to get this best standard of care curative intent therapy or curative intent therapy 
with a novel promising strategy. So everyone gets the best available standard of care treatment. And then some of the women on the study get the novel promising add-on. In this case, it was immune therapy and it translated into an unprecedented improvement in cure rate uh, for early stage triple negative breast cancer and quickly led to FDA approval of um, the immune therapy drug in the curative intent setting. So I want to go back to this graph for just a second. It's so terrific that we're improving cure rates by almost 8% in this setting, but we still have work to do. So 15% uh, of patients still don't experience a cure, even with immune therapy, with chemotherapy. So we need to do better. So how are we going to do better? The only way to do better is through thoughtful, rational clinical trials. And when I was at Sloan Kettering in New York, I had the privilege of working with Dr. Jim Allison, who got the Nobel Prize a few years ago for his important work in identifying the targets of immune therapy. And he was very involved in subsequent drug development that really changed the face of uh, cancer treatment completely, not just in breast cancer, but really in essentially almost every tumor I can think of. And in his lab, they were doing very cool experiments where they were injecting tumors into mice. And this goes back to Dr. Gerber's comments about how we first explore these strategies in the lab, um, in this case in mice. And he, two things, he gave immune therapy to these mice after injecting the tumor, but he also froze the tumor. And the idea with freezing the tumor was twofold. Um, number one, freezing causes inflammatory cells, immune cells to come into the environment. They respond to that tumor freezing, but it also breaks down a tumor into tiny pieces that might be more easily digested by those immune cells. You can Imagine that a ball of tumor is very difficult for these tiny microscopic immune cells to digest. So if you break it down into tiny, more digestible pieces that you might be able to create a more robust immune response. And he was able to show that that was an extremely effective strategy combining the tumor freezing with giving the immune drug. And we were so excited when we saw these results, we thought we need to be doing this in breast cancer. And so this is a study that we undertook in 2009. We enrolled women with early stage breast cancer. And again, this was a very novel strategy in 2009. Immune therapy was not really being considered for, for the treatment of breast cancer. So these were very brave women who um, wanted to try something new that was a little bit outside of the box. So you can see the white areas. This is an MRI. You're looking at a breast from the side. The white area is the tumor. And that little black dot in the middle of that tumor is the needle, the freezing needle. And under the guidance, you can see at the end of the needle, you can create a tiny ice ball. And so you can see that the ice ball is created within the tumor. And after the freezing is completed, you can see that there are these tiny tumor fragments inside the original um, tumor area. So again, using the freezing to cause inflammation, to bring the right cells into the environment, but also to break down that tumor into tiny pieces that'll be more digestible um, to the immune cells. And so we saw in that early uh, experience that um, none of the patients who participated in that early trial have had a recurrence of their breast cancer, including our high-risk triple negative breast cancer patients. So all of the patients participating in that are still breast cancer free um, now more than, 10, uh, more than 10 years out from their treatment. And this directly informed an ongoing phase two studies that Dr. Gerber talked about phase one, phase two, phase three. So this informed a phase two study that we're leading at UT Southwestern that's open at multiple sites across the country, including Los Angeles, Portland, and in Ohio. So this is a very exciting, I think, strategy for our high-risk patients, um, particularly those with triple negative breast cancer and happy to talk about that further. So based on that experience with cryoablation or tumor freezing, um, we thought a lot about how we use other strategies to treat cancer and breast cancer specifically. 
So we often use radiation. We use radiation um, both for early stage breast cancer to consolidate the effect of surgery. We also use it in people who have stage four or advanced breast cancer. In this case, this is a patient, again, we're looking at a PET scan in that red circle, um, highlights the pretty significant burden of lung and lymph node metastases in the central chest. So in this case, this patient had received a lot of prior therapies for metastatic breast cancer, but had progression in these black areas in the central lung and lymph node. She also had brain metastasis and she was referred for brain radiation to treat those brain metastasis. And we thought, why don't we do a clinical trial where we take advantage of the fact that people are going for standard of care brain radiation. Again, radiation causes inflammation. It breaks down tumor into tiny pieces. Why don't we do the same thing that we did with the tumor freezing and add in immune therapy because it might be a perfect complement. And there was a lot of um, data from the lab supporting that this was a rational strategy. And so we did that in this case, she had her brain radiation, she got her immune therapy, and she had complete disappearance of all of those black areas, all of those lung and lymph node metastases um, with breast cancer disappeared completely. And this was a durable, long lasting response. So we were very excited to see um, these kinds of responses in these and other clinical trials that we conducted looking at combining standard of care radiation with immune therapy. And so, as I said earlier, whenever we have some innovation in the metastatic space, we often try and move those same strategies into the curative intent space so we can prevent metastatic disease from even occurring. And so we did that in this study, we undertook a PEARL, it was called the PEARL study. And basically breast cancer patients who were going for lumpectomy, they typically get radiation after their surgery. And we just borrowed some of that radiation that they were going to get later on anyway, and gave it upfront at their diagnosis with immune therapy. So taking advantage of the tumor before it was removed by surgery, Again, trying to break it down into pieces, cause inflammation, and then give immune boosting medications uh, prior to standard of care therapy. And with that strategy, we found that more than 50% of patients actually had no evidence of cancer left at the time of surgery, indicating that this was a very effective strategy. And we are since undertaking a larger phase two study led here at UT Southwestern, which we're going to going to partner with um, other UT sites um, looking at that same strategy. And I'm going to finish up by um, bringing things full circle. We've talked quite a bit, I think, about taking new ideas from the bedside, learning from um, the Petri dishes, from the mouse models, and then taking those promising strategies into the lab. But um, I'll taking what we're learning into in the real world and taking it back to the lab. So it's a full circle of information. So um, several of my partners, including Dr. Isaac Chan in our group, um, he's a breast cancer oncologist as well, but he has a lab and we're taking samples from people who are participating in clinical trials and he can grow those cells up and they're very pure and we can learn a lot um, by taking that information back to the lab. And you can see here, I hope, on the left side is um, one of the organoids that he's created, again, from a, from a patient sample. And you can see the tentacles that are growing out. This is how cancer spreads. And on the right, you can see, um, oops, sorry. On the right, you can see um, how um, he injects these immune cells into the environment. And you can see how they really keep the tumor under control. So in this case, we're learning from an individual patient experience, um, how we can modify the environment um, to their tumor. And that will lead again to innovation that will go back into clinical practice. So it's a full loop of bench to bedside and then back to the bench because we need to have continuous learning from each of these patient experiences for those 
um, men and women who are, are brave to try new things on clinical trials. So with that, I'll stop by saying this is my hope. This is a doctored cover of Science Magazine. It's my hope that um, this will be the future cover of Science, that cancer is cured with immune therapy. Um, but obviously, we still have a lot of work to do to refine our um, strategy. Again, the idea is to improve cure rates but to minimize toxicity. And we're working very hard to try to come up with rational biologic combinations that decrease the necessity for chemotherapy, which can incur a lot of toxicity. So that's really the focus of our uh, research program is trying to optimize treatments, um, ideally giving more rational strategies so that people can get less chemotherapy. So with that, I'll hand it back over to you, Dr. Gerber. Um, I want to take a moment uh, as we finish tonight's presentation and, and talk not only about how we can improve cancer treatment through clinical trials, but maybe start thinking critically about how we can improve clinical trials. Uh, because to answer the question that I had before, um, well under 5% of adult patients with cancer in the U.S. are enrolled in cancer clinical trials. And uh, I received this mailing at home a few years ago that pointed out all of the problems with cancer clinical trials. And um, I thought to myself, who's sending me this? I mean, does MD Anderson know that I've already got a job at a better institution? I wasn't sure. I then noticed that it wasn't addressed to me, it was addressed to my wife. And then I flipped it over. And next slide, Heather. Um, it wasn't coming from a cancer center. It was coming from a congressman running for reelection. And so that said something to me. First of all, I was impressed that this was raised as an issue. Um, whether or not that led me to vote for this candidate, um, we can discuss at a later time point. Um, but it reminded me that the general public um, is really interested in this topic. So next slide. So you know, depending on who you ask, it's either under 2% or certainly under 5% of people are getting on clinical trials. 40% of the trials that the government sponsors don't get completed. Um, and so when you don't accrual to clinical trials, it takes longer to do them. You have less diverse populations. You not, might, might not be able to apply your results to everyone. Uh, you limit the number of people who get access to those exciting treatments at that point. And most importantly, you leave really important clinical questions unanswered. Next slide. So probably more than any other cancer center in the country, um, what faculty here at the Simmons Cancer Center have done is we've actually started studying the clinical trial process to improve it. And that goes from trial design to how you make trials available, to how you activate or start trials, how you enroll patients to trials, and then how you do things once someone's on a clinical trial. Next slide. And one of the first things that was found was that even though for decades, groups have been saying, make trials easier for people to qualify for, the number and complexity of eligibility criteria or exclusion criteria keeps growing. These are the numbers over the decades from lung cancer clinical trials. The average age of lung cancer, of, of patients at diagnosis of lung cancer in the US is 71, and over 85% of them are former or current smokers. So yeah, most of them have some heart disease. Most of them have some lung disease. You can't keep just excluding all these patients from clinical trials. Next slide. Here's quickly a problem that I ran into a few years ago in my clinic, two similar cases. The first is a 58-year-old retired surgeon who comes to me with stage four metastatic lung cancer for a trial, but I can't enroll him on any of our trials because four years before he had stage one prostate cancer that was treated with surgery. And the other is a 52-year-old woman with stage four breast cancer, and three years before she had stage one breast cancer that was treated. And for both these patients, there was no other reason that they were excluded, except they'd had an earlier cancer. And that didn't make sense to me because stage four lung cancer is a really serious disease with potentially a limited prognosis. 
And I could not think in any way why a history of prior cancer would have anything to do with how well someone responded to or tolerated a steady treatment. Next slide. So we ask these questions formally. How often is this the case? Well, over 80% of the lung cancer trials that we looked at excluded people with prior cancer. We looked at national data sets and found that depending on the stage of lung cancer, up to 25% of patients had had another type of cancer before their lung cancer, amazingly. And then when we plugged all that information in, we found that some clinical trials, we projected it excluded more than 15% of patients for that reason alone. And if it's a phase three clinical trial enrolling 2,000 patients, that's 300 patients who can't join just because they'd had a cancer in the past. Next slide. So we asked the obvious question. If you have lung cancer and you had an earlier cancer of a different type before versus the lung cancer being your first cancer ever, does it affect how long you live? The answer is no. So we decided this is a common problem. It affects a lot of people and it's not justified. And this was really fortunate because we got the NIH and the FDA to change their policies. And now when you look at lung cancer clinical trials around the globe, people with prior cancers are not excluded. Next slide. But you know what? Once patients do qualify for trials, it's still not an easy process sometimes. And this is a case of a woman on a clinical trial where she's actually getting an approved therapy on the trial. It's a pill treatment for lung cancer, which normally, were it not on a clinical trial, we could mail it to her with a 90-day supply. But because she's on a clinical trial, she's required to come in person every four weeks to pick it up, even though it's the same drug that would otherwise be mailed. Next slide. Well, you know what? There are not many silver linings to a global pandemic that's killed millions of people, but simplified clinical trial processes may be one of them. And because COVID has led to quarantines, travel limitations, difficulty with supply chain issues and clinics closing, groups like the FDA and the NIH said, you know what? We got to make things easier and more straightforward to protect everyone's safety, but still be able to do clinical trials. For the first time, allowing telephone and video visits, allowing people to get their study lab tests done near their home, rather than driving all the way to the clinical site. Um, doing remote informed consent. So having people do a video chat and sit on the couch at home surrounded by their family for those 45 minute conversations rather than sitting in a busy clinic room um, and shipping oral study therapy to patients' homes so they don't have to drive all the way in to get it. Now, one of the issues with all these recommendations is that they're a little bit like Cinderella's carriage and they will expire when the federal government decides officially that the COVID public health emergency is over. And that could be spring of 2023. Next slide. So we studied how people feel about these changes. And not everyone felt that these changes should continue in the future. But for all of these different changes, like shipping therapy and telehealth visits and offsite diagnostic studies, it was the people experienced in clinical trials who are the ones who felt most strongly that they should be continued. And that has given me confidence to go later this month to the FDA to argue that these should be continued indefinitely. Next slide. Well, it turns out that because the public is highly interested in cancer clinical trials, the public is really highly interested in our work in this area. And it's been really an honor and humbling to have the New York Times and NPR and NBC and USA Today, the Washington Post feature this work that our faculty has done. And that has helped us get more funding for these studies. Next slide. So to close, how can you learn about available clinical trials? Well, here for our cancer center, we have a cancer answer line where you call and there's an option for clinical trials and you will get directed to someone who's in charge of our clinical research office. There's also a website. I think Leslie put in the chat before another link that lists trials. And clinicaltrials.gov is a wonderful resource for people 
to find trials not only based on the type of cancer they have, but on areas near their home. And that brings us to the end of the presentation. I think we have gone a little bit over our assigned time. I apologize. I think Heather and I feel so passionately about this and we're happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Dr. Gerber and Dr. MacArthur. Thank you for your presentations. We will now begin the Q&A portion of this session, starting with some questions submitted ahead of time before addressing some of the questions in the chat. So the first one is for Dr. MacArthur. Please share more about new developments in cancer, cancer treatments for breast cancer caused by the BRCA gene. That's a great question. Um, so some people are born with a mutation or a change in the genetic area called BRCA. Um, less than 10% of people affected by breast cancer have a mutation in a gene that explains the sort of why me question, why did I get this diagnosis? So it means that more than 90% of patients, I just never know exactly why they develop breast cancer. Um, but in less than 10% of the patients, um, people have a, a mutation in that gene and that gene is responsible for DNA repair. DNA is always at risk of getting broken and it needs to be repaired. And there are multiple mechanisms in place um, to repair that DNA and, and BRCA is responsible um, as one pathway. So one of the most promising um, therapeutic areas for patients with um, BRCA mutation associated breast cancers is this class of drugs called PARP inhibitors. Um, Olaparib is a drug that's approved and telozoparib, those are two drugs that are approved for advanced disease. And then in the last couple of years, we've seen one of those PARP inhibitors, Olaparib, approved in the early stage breast cancer setting um, for people with early stage BRCA associated breast cancers with improvements in cure rates um, when that drug is added into the curative intent strategy. And what PARP inhibitors do is they also interfere with DNA repair. So you get kind of a two hit attack on tumor DNA repair one is inherited by the person, which is the mutation in the BRCA, so they've already lost one DNA repair mechanism. And then the PARP inhibitor attacks another DNA repair mechanism, and it makes those cancer cells um, exquisitely sensitive to cell death. So that's been an incredibly promising strategy for BRCA mutated uh, associated breast cancer. Thank you. Our next question, um is how do doctors determine what trials are for or appropriate for certain cancers? Uh, so Charlie, I guess that nuanced question is for me. Um, and, and how a center like Simmons um, chooses which trials to open at our center um, requires considering a lot of different factors. Um, you know, usually when you think about a cancer, you think about the different stages of cancer. And Dr. MacArthur talked about kind of stage one breast cancer and surgery trials and stage four breast cancers that may uh, be mostly treated with medical therapies like chemo and immune therapy. And then we also divide cancer not only by the stage, but by subtype information. Um, like um, the triple negative type that's negative for hormone receptors and other markers or positive for those markers. And depending on how large the cancer center is, um, we may only wanna have one clinical trial available for each of those subsets of cancers so the trials aren't fighting each other to enroll patients. We would love to be able to enroll as many, as, to be able to open as many clinical trials as possible. But the reality is, is that it takes a lot of work to open and manage clinical trials, even separate from evaluating and enrolling patients for clinical trials. So I think that's why at a huge center like ours, we have 200 some clinical trials for all different cancer types and stages rather than having 2,000 types of trials. And when we make those decisions, I think we try to make 
the decisions based on what do we think is the most exciting, promising treatment among the different trials, but also importantly, which trials have the best design? And if a trial has a really promising treatment, but the eligibility criteria are not realistic and we don't think that we'll be able to find anyone eligible, we might not choose to open that study. Thank you, Dr. Gerber. Dr. McArthur, this next question is for you. You talked about uh, triple negative in your presentation and uh, Carol, um, she put an answer to this question in the chat and we would like for you to elaborate on it. Stuart asks, what is triple negative? Can you elaborate on that for us? Absolutely. Um, I, 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 and I apologize, I didn't explain that at all. So thank you for, um, thank you for the question. So um, historically we have categorized breast cancers into three different categories based on um, specific biologic features. So we look at three specific biologic features. Um, the, the presence or absence of estrogen receptors. So we're looking to see if estrogen or hormone levels are driving the disease potentially. We look at another hormone receptor called progesterone. So related to the estrogen receptor. So we're looking at two different hormone receptors. And then we look at um, a protein to see if it's on the surface of cancer cells called HER2, about 20% of breast cancers have this HER2 protein on the surface. And so we conventionally have looked at all three of those um, biologic features to categorize breast cancers into um, three piles, basically. Either they're HER2 positive because they have that protein HER2 on the surface of the cell, or they're hormone receptor positive because they have either the estrogen or the progesterone receptor present, or they're completely lacking in those three um, biomarkers or biologic features, in which case we call it triple negative, which just means that there's an absence of that biologic information. Um, Conventionally, how we have um, categorized breast cancers into three different categories. So I, I hope that makes sense. Um, we're, you know, we're we're um, learning and evolving right now in breast cancer. I'll say that in the last few years, um, it has become an incredibly exciting time to be treating breast cancer because we have had an unprecedented number of FDA approvals for new drugs. Um, not with small incremental benefits, but overall survival. So um, life expectancy improvements and improvements in, in cure rates in the early stage setting. Um, so it's been really an exciting time to treat breast cancer. And one of the drugs, the drug that was most recently approved by the FDA um, is a drug that targets HER2, but at very low levels, that protein that I said is on about 20%. Um, of breast cancers in abundance. In some cancers, it's present in low levels, and now we have strategies to target those drugs. So now we're looking at a fourth category now to think about breast cancer, because we constantly have new insights into the biologic drivers of disease, and we have had unprecedented drug development that are um, with drugs that are able to target or take advantage of these biologic insights. So it's, it's really been an exciting time to be treating breast cancer. Thank you, Dr. McArthur. And since we're talking about approved drugs, I would like to go to Eloise's question. And she asks, how many people are cured from breast cancer via approved drugs versus through clinical trials of a new drug? That's a great question. Um, so. It depends on the stage of disease at diagnosis. Um, about 80 to 90% of early stage breast cancers are, di are cured um, with standard of care treatment. Anything that is experimental or anything that's being evaluated on a clinical trial in the early stage setting, again, um, is, is um, usually an add-on treatment to the standard of care. So usually it's standard of care plus promising drug X is usually the randomization that we see. And it's promising drug X because promising drug X 
um, improved survival in the metastatic setting. So again, moving those strategies earlier on in the course of disease to prevent metastatic disease um, from occurring. So in large randomized phase three trials, people are randomized to the best available gold standard standard of care versus the best available gold standard of care plus drug X. And um, cure rates depend in part on those three subtypes that I just described for you, the HER2 positive, ER positive, um, and triple negative, because they actually have different natural histories. Um, and it depends on the stage of disease. But as I think I showed you, that trend in, um, in survival um, is um, really impressive. And, and it's approaching 90% of early stage breast cancers being cured, which is tremendous. We're now actually pivoting our clinical trials to try and dial back some of the chemotherapy for those who don't need it. So does everybody need four or five or six drugs to be cured? No, probably not. And so we're looking at a lot of what we call de-escalation strategies um, to try and give less toxic, more rational treatments to those who don't need as much treatment. And we're really working hard to try and tailor treatment recommendations to the, um, the risk, um, tailored to the risk of the patient. So we're, we're really attending to these risk benefit calculations now. Thank you. Dr. Gerber, my next question is for you. Um, Angela asks, how old do you have to be to participate in any of the clinical trials? Great question. So um, cancer is far less common um, in children than it is in adults. Um, but uh, clinical trials in pediatric populations in oncology have made tremendous advances. The most common form of cancer in children is leukemia. And in the 1960s, uh, pediatric or childhood leukemia was essentially fatal. Um, now pediatric leukemia is cured over 90% of the time, and that's because of clinical trials. When children go on clinical trials, especially if they're very young, they're clearly not the ones reviewing the consent form and providing the written informed consent. It's generally a parent or a guardian. Um, the children, um, when they're older, may provide something called assent. Um, as children get older, um, before they reach the age of 18, they may start occasionally to get adult type cancers, um, still quite rare, but this was a real um, this was a real problem because these people, these children were, were not getting childhood cancers, but they were too young to participate in clinical trials, which traditionally said at least 18 and above for most cancer trials. And the FDA has recently really pushed people to lower that age to 12. Granted, if you're 12 years old, you still need your parent or guardian to be part of the consent process, but the FDA and others have realized that biologically, in terms of the things that matter when it comes to chemotherapy and immune therapy, like how the liver and the kidneys metabolize or process medicines, 13 and 14 year olds may be like 20 year olds and 60 year olds. So it depends on the trial. The default for adult cancer trials is still probably 18, but increasingly we're seeing a lower age. And we almost, almost never see a maximum age for eligibility. When we think about enrolling on a trial or even giving approved cancer treatments, we never base our decision on someone's chronological age. We base it on what their function is and how healthy they are. Thank you. I'm gonna go back to one of our pre-submitted questions and this is for either or both doctors to answer. Um, the question is, I am a high school science teacher. What should my students know about the future of cancer research and what is most exciting? Well, um, Heather, do you want to uh, say anything about I, that? I hope I've conveyed, I mean, I only touched on immune therapy today, but that's really revolutionized cancer across so many tumor types. And we're still, you know, working on trying to figure out what the best partners are with immune therapy 
um, and how to select people who are most likely to um, benefit from these combination strategies. In breast cancer world, at least, um, the most promising other strategy, I think, is this class of drugs called antibody drug conjugates, where a chemotherapy drug is specially linked to an antibody, just like your body makes antibodies in response to infection. They're developing antibodies that target tumor, and then they tie it directly to a chemotherapy drug. And the idea is that if the antibody targets tumor cells specifically, that you can get drug directly to cancer cells and minimize the amount of side effects that you usually see when you give chemotherapy through an IV without these antibodies linked. And what's really cool about these new antibody drug conjugates is what they're called, is that once they're um, taken in by the cell, so the antibody brings the chemotherapy drug to the cancer cell, it gets released in the neighboring area, killing any of the cancer cells in the, in the neighborhood that may or may not also have that target. So this is called a bystander effect. And one of the challenges in cancer treatment and certainly breast cancer treatment is the diversity of the cancer cells. They don't all look the same and they're not all biologically the same. They are, you can think of them as cities of different cells coexisting and living together and they all have different features. And so these antibody drug conjugates are very exciting because they not just target the, the cell of interest, but they also are spreading into the neighboring cells and killing those cancer cells as well. So that's been kind of a revolutionary strategy for the treatment of breast cancer with countless uh, FDA approvals in the last uh, couple of years with those kinds of drugs. Uh, you, David, I'll just make please. two really, really quick points. So um, unless you've been living under a rock, you've heard about cancer immune therapy, right? It's, it's in the newspaper, it's on TV. Pharmaceutical companies make billions of dollars from immune therapy because they've got big advertising budgets and, and rightly so, it's really promising. But what if I told all of you that when I give chemotherapy to my patients with lung cancer, the chance that they ever throw up is less than 5%. That's amazing, amazing, why is that? Clinical trials not focused on effectiveness, clinical trials focused on quality of life, supportive care. You guys don't hear about that in the news, but we have transformed cancer care to not only make it more effective, but make it more feasible and easier for our patients. And when it's easier, they do better, they can get more treatment. The other comment that I want to make is that increasingly cancer research is team science. It's not just one person doing it. It's a group of people. And when I think about my background, I'm probably the last person you would ever think of as doing cancer research, right? I majored in history when I was in college. Between college and med school, I worked as a juvenile probation officer, which was great training for being a parent. I don't know how useful it is for being a faculty member here, um, but I think you know it doesn't matter what your high school students are focused on right now. Um, if you're curious and you're willing to ask and answer questions, um, even people like me can be cancer researchers. So there are lots of ways to go about it. I agree with that. I I. Um... As a personal story, um, I became interested in research because someone during my fellowship invited me to participate in a clinical trial and that person infected me with their enthusiasm for innovation for breast cancer patients and it changed my life forever. And so to those high school students, I would tell them, seek your passion. Um, find people who inspire you and follow those people and then carve out new directions. Um, because I think I could have as easily been a cardiologist or a nephrologist. And it was, it was really that infusion 
um, of passion that changed my life forever. And uh, so I hope my, my children, um, I have three boys, I hope that they find that in the course of their, uh, their, um, their budding careers, so. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, um, Dr. Skerber and MacArthur for this enlightening conversation. Um, I, I think we are all inspired with the hope of your remarks. And, um, and when we talk about cancer, it's wonderful to have hope. Um, to our guests, many thanks for joining us tonight and for your really great questions. And we're sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but I think we need to have another clinical trial science cafe next year. So please join us in 2023 for that. Thank you to Charlie for moderating Q&A tonight and for the collaboration with our colleagues in Simmons Comprehensive Cancer Center, especially Leslie Pomeroy. Our next Science Cafe is in two weeks. We are going to talk about breast cancer reconstruction surgery, the research and the treatment advances that have been um, made just over the last 10 years. And then November 3rd, we have a Science Cafe about Gulf War illness. One of our doctors has been doing research for 28 years and they have found the cause for that. Uh, for now, thanks again for joining us. We wish each of you good health and wellness and a good night, and we are adjourned. <laughs>